new series. We had four series of the, um, God, what was that? Personal and Psychic and Gut Evolution. We ended that. So if you would like to look at those, our four previous ones. The new uh, theme, which we won't have a community dinner talk uh, this week, next week or the following. So on the 23rd and the 30th, there won't be a talk. So we're going to just we're going to continue this when I can come back. And summer is about discernment. Light is about discernment. And so this talk series is all the crystallization of thought. You could say the crystallization of thought forms in the human body. And I've been thinking about this for off and on for 20 years. And what triggered it last week was this like neck thing and my neck popped and then all this pressure released and i had a coach slash mentor years ago and I, I asked him about what happens when you pop your joints and he was like oh it's so bad for you and i was like i don't agree with you when i pop my joint it feels like there's a release of tension and energy i don't agree with you i don't know what it is and you don't know what it is so let's leave it at that so i packed my neck again and i was like there's it there it is again so i study alchemy and in alchemy the upper or anthroposophy also talks about this. They have the air element, and that's composed of thoughts and forms of consciousness that aren't in a body. So the air elements like spirits and elementals and life forms. Then you go down the next level down of density is the blood. To keep it very simple. The blood is the mediator of thought and matter in these traditions in alchemy. So the blood is the mediator of thought forms and matter. And then the salt. The alchemists call this the salt or, you know, the minerals or the form, right? And so when something pops, then to me, having done 25 years of body work, I see people when they get a pop or they get a release, then there's usually a memory that comes with it. Uh, for example, I had a client, I was working on her back and right between her shoulder blades and she goes, oh, stop right there. It was right side, right underneath the scapula around T4 or 5. And it's usually the area where People are protecting their heart. In Chinese medicine is called the heart protector meridian. So I'm in there and she goes, just hang out there for a minute. So I just got my elbow and just hung out for about two or three minutes and she went quiet. And then she came to and she, her eyes were wide open. I mean, she, she had her head face down and she lifted her head up and she goes, oh my God, like, what happened? She goes, oh, this memory came up and I got really angry. And I'm like, well, what was it? She says, I had this memory I'd forgotten about of my uncle groping me in the swimming pool when I was eight years old. Whoa. and so she had buried that memory because she didn't know what to do with it when she was seven or eight because he probably threatened her in some way and then so the release for her was the anger and wanting to kick his ass and she allowed herself to feel that so it, it released and now it's gone and so that's why i call this the crystallization of thought because this isn't a theoretical thing this is 25 years in practice um, i'm 56 now i've been monitoring my thoughts for 50 years since i was five or six years old and I'll definitely tell you that we are here to embody our thoughts. And Carl Jung said, we aren't here to ascend. We're here to make the darkness conscious. My teacher Adyashanti talks about that. We're here to make the darkness conscious. We're not here to ascend. That's half of it. The other half is the downward. We got this going on. Half ascension, half embodiment. And that's where we're at. And that's why I do these talks, because we got to learn how to embody our vehicle, our earth suit. So in this case, then, you know, there's different forms of this. And that's the point of this tonight is that it's best to get personal experience stories and you get out of the theory, right? And so that was two of the, the cracking of the neck and the lady with the and um, intestinal stuff had multiple memories surface when black tar or space egg aliens would come out of me during my parasite work. Hence the, the gut, the gut and the soul evolution, the reincarnation cycles being tied to our gut bugs desires. That ties right in with this. So one time I passed this black tar came out of this diarrhea black tar. I was traveling down to Santa Barbara doing a lecture um, and, you know, doing freaking parasite herbs on the drive, which wasn't a good idea. So you had to pull over every hour, you know, for a, a, a leakage, you know, a liquid leakage. And this thing came out of me and I knew because I could sense it was like this was a different bowel movement. And then my body would go into this buzz and then there'd be a memory that would come like, oh, there's that memory from 25 years ago when I laid on the couch and overate and threw up and oh, oh yeah, there was that grief and sadness associated with that that I couldn't process at the time and now it worked its way out. So in Chinese medicine, then there's different angles you can take with how thoughts come into the body. So you can go with the, um, the elements. And so you could talk about a thought form of anger. So is anger hot or cold? I thought 
hot, right? Um, so anger is a hot emotion and it's usually associated with the liver. And what is anger though? You know, anger after exploring, you know, my personal anger for 40 years, uh, <laughs> anger management is it's a fence emotion. There's always a tender emotion that it's protecting in the middle. Mm -hmm. Grief, sadness, fear. Somebody cuts me off on the freeway. I get scared and get angry, right? It's a natural response to save your life when someone's driving like an ass is to get angry. Better to just avoid them and not get angry, of course, but that's one mechanism we use. And so in my therapy work over the years, and when anger arises, and there's the question is what's underneath that? Because if anger arises, there's always something underneath it. It's usually not there on its own. And there's these fencing motions that protect us from looking at the tender underbelly, the, the vulnerable part. Um, so anger is one, and anger is associated with stuck creativity in Chinese medicine. Uh, Ted Kapchuk in The Web It Has No Weaver, it's the beginning Chinese medicine text. Second paragraph probably says, you know, all anger is, is blocked creativity. I thought that was a lovely way of looking at it. So then you could go to the next element up. So what about joy or mania or sadness? They're all associated with the fire element. So you could have, so I got asked by, uh, by Cindy's daughter if I was bipolar a few weeks ago. I had to say, yeah, sure, yeah, I got some bipolar tendencies, sure, I couldn't resist, so there's two forms of bipolar, you could conceptualize this, one form is a blood sugar imbalance, where your blood sugar's up, and you feel pretty good, and then it drops, and you feel rotten, and then it goes up, and you feel good, and it goes down, you're rotten, but if you're eating, the more, the more simple sugars you eat, the more it goes up too high, and the more it goes down too low, and they also wanted to have a, a good time length, where goes up to 100 to 180 over an hour or two and then drops over an hour or two the last thing you want is having to go up to 180 down to 80 in five minutes that's called reactive hypoglycemia and there's no way to test for that unless you have your own meter to test every five minutes but that doesn't no one talks about that the frequency of the of the variance is really the problem and if carl had a gun or you know a glucometer then you could test this with people like every check it every five minutes and oh shit it went from 100 down to 80 in five minutes that's an adrenaline alone and that's why the liver, the adrenals, and the pancreas are in a triad for blood sugar. So you can actually have adrenal exhaustion from blood sugar imbalance. I was one of them. You can have adrenal exhaustion from blood sugar problems. Because every time the blood sugar goes too high or too low, there's an alarm that goes off. Generally, when the blood sugar is high, we don't have symptoms except excessive urination. So our body's trying to pee out the sugar. So it's one sign you have excessive urination and you didn't drink a lot of water, if you ate a lot of sugar, your body's trying to get the sugar out. And dry skin is also a sign of elevated blood sugar. Moist, wet skin is a sign of low blood sugar, for example. I have a chart for all this too, if you want to look at it. it. Talks about high blood sugar signs and low and what imbalances are. So if you find yourself you know, hungry and irritable, waking up in the middle of the night, um, shaky, nervous between meals, crazy carb cravings, sugar cravings, then generally it might have dropped too much too fast. I mean, your body has to deal with that, that hunger because the brain actually doesn't need sugar. It needs um, ketones, fat. Um, fat is the preferred fuel source of most people for the brain. At least. It's just that our other cells in the gluco-adapted people, they need carbs. And then the, the keto-adapted people need fat for energy. And we should be able to adapt. That's what the mixed, so that's what the mixed blood type is, Monica. The mixed type can go either way. So you want to be a mixed type, ideally, because then you can be adaptable. Uh, and Katie's a type AB. So blood type ABs are also very, you want an AB? Oh, who was the AB I just had? I had a brand new AB. I thought it was you. But... So a brand new AB client. And so the ABs are the most recent adaptation of the human, the human genome. There was the O was the first. And this is according to Diodamo. Eat right for your type. Then 20,000 years ago, there was a, the A mutation came around. 10,000 years ago, the B mutation came around. Two to 5,000 years ago, the AB came around. And Diodamo joked and said, what if Jesus was the first AB? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was joking. But there's, there's no archaeological evidence the guy ever existed, so I don't know how I could even say that. Um, so AB is a recent, so if you're an AB and a mixed type, then you get the best of everything. You get everything. 
But if you're an O from a northern climate and lots of C answers on your metabolic score like me, you don't get any carbs. <laughs> you get none. How do you know? Well, I found out. I left carbs out of my diet. My life improved dramatically. Then my carb addict guy had to die too. So going kind of long on that. Oh, because of the crystallization of thought. So joy, that's what the blood sugar. So the, the bipolar then can be caused from nothing more than reactive hypoglycemia. And you go manic to depressed, to manic. So all mania is, according to Chinese medicine, is excess joy. Mania, to really non-pathologize it, it just means you have too much joy. And your body can't, you're, you're blue, your circuit's out for so much. Um, and it's an imbalanced fire element. Too much fire, not enough fire. Too much fire, not enough fire. Um, then the other form of bipolar is um, someone that's probably had, like you look at this fire element thing and if someone's been uh, traumatized or has had a lot of extreme things happen in their life, then they might default to being numb at the bottom and numb at the top because you don't have to feel either way, right? If you're manic, you're not really feeling. And if you're depressed, you're not really feeling. I mean, ideally you would be, but that's my observation. Because in Chinese medicine, there's also five kinds of depression associated with each of the five elements. So there could be like a manic depressive, like depression, you know, at the bottom, depressed at the bottom. I knew an alcoholic guy that was in my practice for years and he would get manic and he had a, he was a salesman and he would get like a $10,000 commission and he would spend it all in one weekend. His wife divorced him because of it. Wow. Yeah, his wife left him because he would put them in the poorhouse when he got manic and he would hide in the room when he was depressed. So the crystallization of thought in his life, then, if you will, is um, stuck, right? So there's this thing here, bad thought, stagnation, and rot. So stagnation of anything in the body is usually due to rot. We've talked about that with the gut. You know, we overeat, we get rot, and then rot generate stagnant thoughts. So that's where the bad thoughts and the nightmares usually are associated with toxicity in the body. And I know that because uh, every time I do an enema and clear, and clear the waste out of my colon that has built up into my bloodstream, all dark thoughts go away in less than an hour of a set of, a set of enemas. I can't live in the world I used to live in because I would blow my brains out. The old, the old crystallization of my thought, that guy is dead, he has to stay dead. So when I go back that way, sometimes by eating some of the same foods I used to eat, living the way I used to live, then I approach that, <laughs> that death valley depression, you know, person. It's like, I gotta, you know, I love this guy, but I can't go back. And for other people, you know, we all have these uh, past parts of ourselves we'd like to integrate more fully, right? You know, we don't wanna leave any part of ourselves behind. That's not good either. If we don't love all parts of ourselves, then we have work to do even the killer in us, even the dark one part. There's a mother, um, I read a book by Norman Mailer called The Executioner's Song. And it was a true story. And he was a murderer. And his mother loved him to the end. Mm -hmm. I got a murderous thought person in my mind. I have a homicidal <laughs> thought guy in my I got to live with every day. Some days it's awful. I might have 50 to 100 homicidal thoughts. I got to deal with it. So why, are, why does it arise? That's the question. Who are you and what do you need? Do you need love? Do you need care? That's the deeper question. Instead of pushing it away, is what most of us do. Hey, how can I hug you? And on that note, that's the roomy poem I share with a lot of groups. So I'm going to share that right now. It's called The, uh, the Guest House. And it's worthy, uh, The Guest House. And Rumi was kind of a trickster, but a good kind of trickster. The Guest House, Rumi. So I'll read this, and this is a pointer. Like most good pieces, they're pointers. It's not the gospel truth. Like the Bible is not the gospel truth. It's a pointer. The Guest House from our Gelatin Rumi. Uh, Coleman Barks translation, to make it even better. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor, welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows, 
who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out. Well, we should put in he, she. He, she may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So why would a man write that? Why would somebody write that? He's pointing at something. And that's pointing the same thing I'm pointing at is you're, you are the earth suit. Right. And so if there's aberrant stuff going on in the present moment, that's the work. I'm recycling on this grief. I'm recycling on this regret that I had from last week. I shouldn't have yelled at this person. That's the work. Because I'm not clean in the moment. I keep going back to the past. That's not clean. Or Mr. Rodriguez, you know, I can't imagine what he must have been going through. You know, like, it's hard to have clean thinking when you're being tortured and abused, you know. Right. This is basically what was happening to him. And there's the Tibetan monk that I heard about that was kidnapped by the Chinese when they raided Tibet years ago and took over the country and they had him then tortured in prison for 30 years. And they asked him, what were you doing in prison for 30 years? You know what he said? Yes. Trying to have compassion for his captors. Wow. The high level soul right there. That's high level stuff. Mm. I'm not there. I'd be planning ways to butcher them. And I got out, to be honest. You know, that's where I'm at. I would love to be able to have compassion, but I got, you know, revenge just feels too good when you're in that place. You know, you know there's the brave hearts of the world and we're watching Outlander, you know, you see like, you know, we're moving into a different era and ideally we'll move without minimal, you know, loss of human life and damage to the planet. But, you know, we're in a tough place right now. Cause it's, you know, the face of the godless has been exposed. What's running the world? All right, back to you. Let's see. I was going to the oh yeah. So we got to the bipolar, the fire element. So the next one down is liver, and that's anger. Oh, excuse me, that's earth element, fire element, earth element, and that's empathy and natural empathy, natural compassion is part of the earth element. Um, think about it. the soil is connected to all the other soil on the planet, right? What grows in the soil is connected to the tree over there. Isn't different from the tree ten feet away. They're connected via the roots. No, I mean, they are. Because the brain of the plants is in the soil. They're inverted us. They're green people. They don't appear to be thinking, but they are. Because consciousness isn't centered in this. It's centered out here and in here, but not limited to this. Anybody been on the other side? I've been on the other side. Dead. Looking down at my body. Multiple times. So what the fuck has that been? You know, physicians have died. Raymond Moody did a, you know, life after life. This parapsychologist wrote a book about it. Studied a thousand people who had clinically been proven dead, flatlined. And what are their commonalities, you know? Consciousness is not localized in the person. That's what we found out. That's the, that's the good news, right? So empathy is natural. Compassion is natural. So when you have people running, running things that don't have that, then we end up where we are now. Because there's no, what is it? Like three percent of the population doesn't have any compassion. Is it three yeah. percent? The one they call the evil ones, they don't have any. Two and a half million. Two and a half percent <laughs> of the population. <clears throat> yeah, they well, don't have. That's an old statistic. I don't know. Maybe it's worse with, now. We've been messing with chemicals so long. Who knows? That'd be worse, huh? And now, fifteen months of babies not seeing faces. Yeah. 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 Who yeah. knows what's happened to that person? Yeah. And children, everybody under 10, holy cow, mm. big, bad experiment. Well, because I believe the beings that are controlling that, they're, they're trying to crystallize thought into the forms they want so they can have their slave market continue. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but the, the, the slaves are revolting now, as far as they're concerned, you know, and they're doing their best to clean up the mess. Because they're a little slave game. I read Anna Von Wright's uh, The Bilateral Banking System, part one and two last night. Woo, boy. Juicy stuff, yeah. Talking about where the banks were, you know, before uh, this country got taken over by the corporation, the USA corporation, and what banks used to do. And that was all ended between 1861 and 1910 when the Fed started. So that's uh, 
empathy is where thought, see if you look at this, uh, see thought can come in, there's a point right here between the ears on the center line that's governing vessel 21. That's also this, the point of the seventh chakra where the energy of the cosmos comes into the body and exits out of the body. And then this point on the bottom of the foot, kidney one is called bubbling springs because when you do Tai Chi and Qi Gong, you'll feel bubbles coming up through the earth into your body. And so our energy exits into the earth and enters from there and exits here. Those are, those are acupuncture points to prove my point. And so that comes in here in the top and the first access point to me is the pineal. And then it goes down just above the hypothalamus in the thalamus area and there's something called the sensory gates. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. There's these sensory gates in here and around the thalamus and they determine what we can and cannot perceive. The backup piece of work on this, if anybody wanted to go, is um, Plant Intelligence, the book Plant Intelligence and the Imaginal Realm by Stephen Herod Buhner, B-U-H-N-E-R. And he's got a, well, that book just, oh, and the book before that one he wrote is called The Lost Language of Plants. Why oh, would somebody write a book called The Lost Language of Plants? You know, there must be something to it, right? So that, it comes in and then we filter through the sensory gates what we're going to perceive. So like right now, you know, you might be seeing me in the walls and whatnot, but if you didn't have your sensory gates, then you'd be seeing a million more things than you're seeing right now. And you'd, you wouldn't be able to stay sane. So they're there for a reason. So when we take the, one of those entheogens, mushrooms, peyote, then the, it, the filters open up and we start to perceive more than we were. DMT is like that, the various forms of DMT, it opens it up and then, oh crap, now I'm seeing things I couldn't see before. But guess what? The beings on the other side that you're now seeing can now see you. Mm. I've been a punching bag in some of those astral realms a few times. I'm poking my head up and it shouldn't be up there. Boom, boom, boom. But it's still duality. And then you look your way down and then the hypothalamus and pituitary and the hypothalamus and pituitary have access to all the other endocrine organs. They're connected to the testicles, the adrenals, the thyroid, pancreas. So that's where hormones are nothing more than chemical messengers. The pituitary says, hey, thyroid, you need to speed up. It's called thyroid stimulating hormone. It's not a thyroid hormone, but they'll measure your thyroid status based on that one hormone, a brain hormone. So oh, you have low thyroid. You're measuring the, the brain hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone. So it's telling the thyroid, hey, you're too slow, speed up. It's like kicking the donkey, right? Kick that donkey, get it going. That's what that hormone's doing. So when it's too high, you have a low thyroid, they say, and if it's too low, then no one's knocking on the door and it's too, running too fast. It, it's a decent way to assess thyroid, but it's really, they, they do that on purpose. They can sell more thyroid medications and remove more thyroids and give their toxic iodine to people. Uh, it, it's a really sick, I've seen, 10 thyroids removed that didn't need to be removed. Oh, wow. We've seen 100 gallbladders removed in my practice over the years that didn't need to be removed. Those are in the money of making money. So not getting the knock means that it's moving too fast? Yeah, because it doesn't need any more stimulation. Oh. Thyroid stimulating a hormone. If it's already, that what they call that Graves disease. Okay. When the thyroid's too fast, then you got diarrhea and your skin tear is easy and you can't sleep and you're hyperactive and your heart's racing and your cholesterol's too low. And then high cholesterol is associated with low thyroid and thick skin and dull and sleeps too much. And so it's the opposite. There's, there's tables for all this I could give you guys. If anybody wants to know like what's hyperthyroid versus hypothyroid symptoms, what's high blood sugar versus low blood sugar. I got all that. That was my whole career. Uh, let me move on from that now. So these organs are all connected to each other. And so we have a natural empathy and connection in our own systems because everything's connected to everything else. And hundred years ago, Henry Harrower, the original and only endocrinologist I've ever seen would give people like, okay, let's give a thousand pounds of pineal gland and then measure their lab work and see what happens. Let's give a thousand pounds of thyroid out to these people and see what happens. Let's give adrenals out, let's give pancreases out. So this guy, Henry Harrower was, he was a real endocrinologist and I have his book in my room. So he made a chart showing all the endocrine connections of the body. And guess what's at the center? You, you'll, you'll never guess. Monica, you can't answer. Okay. You already know. 
So you watching the, the video, you can see it now. What do you think is at the center of all the hormone producing organs? It's not the brain. Thyroid. Mm. The thyroid is at the center of everything. And they want to remove it. Oh, you don't need it. Oh, God. <laughs> you don't need it. <laughs> it was put there for like a the reason. Brain. I got a client. That's what they told her. Oh, yeah. Oh, the person, you don't need it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get you on some other day, maybe. Another client that had pancreatic cancer. And uh, these are the cases I get. You know, I just, it's heartbreaking. Hmm. So she was, they had, she had signed the disclaimer form, went into surgery. And then her spleen was in the way when they were moving her pancreas. So they removed the spleen. So I called it a two for one sale. Oh, hey, you got a two for one sale. <laughs> and there was nothing she could do because she signed the waiver. The spleen is filtered, right? It's a really important organ. It's, it's got like 10 functions, but one, it's a giant lymph node. It's one of its functions, you know, mm -hmm. kind of important. So two for one sale. I know someone who died in a, and they got him back to life and he lost his spleen. It was a, a, a drunk a driver. So he hit him uh, down by Moss Landing and they, he heard them say, I think we're losing him. And they lost him, but they got him back to life and he lost his spleen. But I don't know, how do you live without it? I don't know. Gene doesn't have a spleen. Gene huh? lost her spleen. Gene doesn't have one either. So I have her on spleen desiccate. Santa Process has a desiccated spleen product. And so people that take the desiccated spleen, or at least getting some of the spleen energy in their body via the nutrition from a cow spleen or a pig spleen or whatever. And um, oh. I have good results with that. There's three products in the line that I use that are, they have systemic or strange effects. Uh, the chlorophyll pearls are one, the spleen's another. And then the third one is called Fortified Talanzia B12. And it's the Spanish moss that's fortified with spleen. And they don't know how or why, but ladies will take it and then their menopause will go away. So the, the thing with Talanzia usnoides is the Latin name. It's a Spanish moss that grows in the Everglades of Florida. And Royal Lee made it a point to put this in almost all the products on the product line. Because everyone who took this product, he studied empiricism. And all the old timers in the Florida Everglades that ate Spanish moss regularly lived to be over 100. That's the kind of people I want to study under is he's studying who's getting results, right? So that's what he, that's why this product was made. And then they don't even know still how it works 80 years later. You mean menopause symptoms go away. You don't mean she start bleeding. Anymore. No, but I've had a few of those myself. I had one, a couple of ladies in their late fifties, they're, you know, they'd stop bleeding. And then I go, uh, you might start bleeding again. And one of them did for two more years. She didn't like that very much, but. <laughs> <laughs> still healthy, but she felt great. Yeah, she oh. felt great. Yeah, she felt great. We had this thing, I guess it was last night, we were talking about how women live longer than men, right? Yeah, generally. generally. Yeah. And Unless I was taught- Unless we're married. Huh? Unless we're married. Ah! <laughs> 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 Don't live as much. Oh! Married men live longer. Married women live longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's <laughs> awful. Actually, that buddy talks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's awful. awful. <laughs> It doesn't say very good stuff about men, does it? Uh, no, <laughs> that's true. No, work out the Very clear. Oh, man. What if you're married to a feminine male? Would that be different? Let's hope so, right? <laughs> Why? Why do you hope so? Because I'd like to think that my my presence is going to re elevate my partner's life you know, a bit longer. I'd like to believe that. Okay. So. Oh my goodness. So yeah. <laughs> oh. Well look how young you look your age. You must be doing some good here. <laughs> I'll tell you guys, um my ex, um, I won't name her because she wouldn't like it, but my I have an ex that she came to me 13, 14 years ago as a client. She had parasites, she'd gotten in Bali. Um 15 experts later, no one could help her. Oh god. The usual scenario I get, you know. Nobody really understands. They're cocky and arrogant. Oh, we got this. And then I was like, there you go. So we had her doing um, enemas, um, coffee enemas, and she got addicted to them. And so oh. she got addicted to these coffee enemas. They felt so good. I understand. She did them every day for two or three years. Oh, wow. She did the Craig program all the way. And now, see, I met her when she was 38. Now she's 51. And she looks younger than the day I met her. Oh, wow. And 13 wow. years have gone by. She looked older when I met her than she does now. 13 years later. I started the day I was like, you really did your work well. 
So when you turn the guts inside out and get all that junk out and rebuild it, then literally I've seen skin go from eczema, you know, just rotten looking skin. And within a week, it's just like, wow, look at your skin. So this is a good marker of our age. I got old man skin now from probably being in the sun too much and smoking weed, but smoking definitely affects your skin. Anybody who doesn't think so, it does. Yeah. There's a guy who smokes the weed, my skin definitely changed when I start smoking more. Yeah. 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 Right. So back to the, uh, there's two more elements. So then the, you go from in the Chinese wheel, you go down to the metal element, which is the, associated with the fall and the lungs and the large intestine taking in and letting go. And so their emotion is grief, right? You let go, take in and let go. That's the action of the lung and the colon. There's a longer lecture about this, but so when it's stuck, we call that grief. I just call it when it's healthy, it's just fluid consciousness. Things are coming in, things are going out. And in Chinese medicine, they talk about the rhythm. So this element responsible for the rhythm of how we sleep, the rhythm of how we have our appetite, our rhythm of our moods associated with this element. When it gets stuck, we call that grief. So I'm grieving the loss of my dead partner, right? Um, but Jesus has this whole thing. He had this, these really poetic statements. And one of them is, um, you're already forgiven, for example. What were you saying though? You're already forgiven. Oh, I do this horrible thing. I need to be forgiven. Well, you're already forgiven. So what does he mean when he's saying that? What do you think? Peace of mind. You need to be, you need to be at peace with yourself. Yeah. He's pointing at a phenomena. The statement is pointing at a phenomena. Another one, Adyashanti says this, the peace you're seeking is always and already present. Mm -hmm. It's related to the forgiveness thing. Mm -hmm. The forgiveness you seek is always and already present, which means you're already forgiven in the eyes of the divine. Yeah. Yeah. I've recycled this comment a few times, but I saw Abraham Hicks say, I was there at the actual Marriott event years ago, and someone asked Abraham how the channeled entity, Abraham, how they see human. And Abraham said, we see humans in past tense. I heard that too. In past tense, which means they're living in the present moment and we're not. Yeah. We're always at a time delay because by the time I perceive Lara sitting across the room from me, life has moved on to the next moment already. We're always a little bit of a perceptual time delay you know, microseconds, right? Because by the time I perceive Peter sitting there, life's move on to the next thing, right? So the peace you're seeking is always and already present. So it's like, we're, we're up here on the top of the ocean, bobbing around, you know, all the phenomena of the waves. And if you just di dive down deep in the ocean of consciousness, same ocean, but it's very still down below. That's what meditation does. It takes you off the surface level garbage, but same ocean, see? One of my teachers said, this is like, here's you, here's me, here's Jamie, and here's Sammy B. But see, we share the hand, same being, just different. I call them different rosebuds on the human flower. We're all different rosebuds on the human flower. We share the plant, but we appear different, but we're not. And that's an important piece with grief is like, yeah, this person's left or this situation's gone. And to me, the highest state of consciousness is fluid consciousness. I have a whole video about it. You don't get stuck. Like I've been stuck on that woman that was yelling at me last night for 24 hours. And it's, so it's not fluid. Something that she delivered stuck and it's recycling in me. And when I find the key or when the awareness in me is done with it, it, will, it will, won't visit my consciousness again. So anything that's recycling doesn't work because it's not fluid. Ideally we're present where we are. Um, I mean, I will admit as a guy that, you know, I, I love intimacy and sex. So that's my practice wagon because you ladies the second a man my mind wanders every woman i've ever been was like where'd you just go like within three seconds like you know just one little one little distraction hey where'd you go so it's like you know these ladies are really fine-tuned instruments and i respect for you guys so I, I love that because it keeps me present and when i was with this partner i talked about years ago she could read my thoughts that i didn't even know i had I'd come home sometimes happy as a clam and she'd be like, you're not happy. And I at least four or five times in four years completely undressed me because I was willing to look. 
and I'd be in tears after she would tell me what she saw. Like, you ladies are freaking amazing. The stuff you see. And we're, the guys are floating around like, oh, blah, blah, blah. we're doing so good. And the ladies are going, Women over 40 uh, general pretty something. Maybe more than men. The ones who have done their work or the ones who are awake. Yeah, so we want to be able to be where you are and not stuck in the past with, so the, what are the past-based emotions, right? Doubt and regret. They're based in the past, right? You could have doubts about the future, I guess. And I, I term anxiety a future-based emotion. Uh, fear can be past or future, right? You can fear the past or the future. What's the next one? Uh, grief, that would be past. Anxiety? Yeah, either. Can you have anxiety about the past? Yeah, you can also grieve the future. Yeah, you could. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, right. I have. That's a good. That's a good point. You lost a future memory. You, you expected something to continue. Right. And suddenly, it's cut, and you have to deal with that loss. I guess we go back to there's always exceptions to the rule, right? Okay, so let me go back around in the five element wheel, and you go back to the beginning, which is the water element. And the water element, the um, the negative emotion associated with the water element is fear. And the positive uh, element of the water part is the water is the birth, the mother of the new dream, the mother of the new cycle, the mother of the new goal that we're setting for ourselves, the new thought that just came in, the new person in our life, um, the new vision. So it's all that's all water element. Every tradition around the world uses that metaphor. And so water, uh, why do you think? So fear presents as the negative part of the water element, see how the thoughts crystallizing. So, oh, there's a lot of fear present. So let's see, that's good. A good example would be 20 foot waves, Lars. And there's rocks and dry reef, but there's a big barrel waiting for you if you go. So I know for me, I got fear coming up. So how do you push through that? Lars, anybody, how do you push through the fear? You have to be super focused. Yeah, so I can make this. If you say the opposite, you, it really is a when you're out in Big Sur, it is um, it's playing tricks with your mind. Yeah. So you can scare yourself pretty <clears throat> easily. So you, it's like you're having a conversation with yourself, a pretty serious one. Well, I would say I uh, had an amazing experience swimming for my life in British Columbia where there's no chance in hell of survival, zero. No, no, no chance. I could explain the whole story, but it would take a while, but it was impossible. And I was in 60 fathoms of water, and which is what, 360 feet? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Something like that. And a black abyss, and the sun had already set. Uh, there was light in the sky, but there wasn't any on the ground. And there was an incredible storm with rain, pouring down so hard, waves over my head, a couple of people left behind hanging on to the boat, and I'm swimming for our lives. And every stroke I'm going, save them, save them. Oh, and save me too. I was very calm. And I stayed focused on saving their lives, even though there's no chance now. There was no possible chance of surviving them. And this was in swimming in the coldest water for the longest time. Wow, so you had a rope around your neck and then around your body and you were pulling in a boat? No, no, they were hanging on to the boat. I was oh, free, oh. trying to get help. Mm. And like I said, there's no chance in hell that this would work. But I kept focused on saving them. I didn't give up. I had one purpose in mind, and that was to keep swimming and survive. Meantime, I'm looking at the sky going, oh my God, the sky is so beautiful. I'm going to die, quite possibly, but I'm not giving up. But if I die, I've seen the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen. They asked me about that later. They've got people hanging on the boat. They said, so what were you thinking when you were out there? I was thinking, well, I was thinking saving you guys. And, and I was thinking that it's the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> and I said, no, that's what I was thinking. And I looked up, and there's this bird flying above me. I was in, I was going to say, I was in the coldest water the longest time. And when I say the coldest and the longest, I mean, I beat the Guinness Book of World Records. 
I saw this guy on the news who said he swam this amount of time in this temperature water. And I went, I swam longer and in colder water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was in there for 22 minutes. The temperature was 28 degrees mm. from the water. Whew. Now people said, but that's ice. Well, not if it's an ocean and if there's a storm. Right. right. So I was in melted ice Ooh. for 22 minutes. This bird just hovered above me and I'm looking at it going, you think I'm food, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Send me a rope. Send me a rope, you know? And I looked at it and went, you know, I was jealous because I'm struggling for my life and, and, and it's just floating up there. But it stayed with me and it stayed with me and it stayed with me. Um, and I was like, like you're oh lion. my God, you know I'm not food anymore. You know I'm not food. You're staying with me. You have, you are sending me a rope. Yes. Sending me some hope. And then as I'm approaching this island, I had been in the water all this time, gone about, uh, swam about a mile. People say you can't swim that fast. Well, it was a current. I've gone about a mile. And I had about another half mile to go to the point of this island. If I get on the island, there's nobody around. I have to go a mile or so before I come to the first house. And then what? How long would it take for them to come and say, no, that's not going to work. So maybe I can catch the current from that island and climb the lighthouse 200 feet high on this cliff to the lighthouse, get there. Nobody's going to be there. Maybe there'll be a phone. I can call somebody and still it'll take forever if I die. You know? So as I'm getting closer to this island, I'm starting to tell you more about the story, but I'm not going to go on too long, but just enough to tell you, I saw these guys, two boats out there close to the island. And my first thought was, what the hell are you guys doing out in this water? This, this storm, you gotta be out of your minds. And it dawned on me, no, what I'm supposed to be saying is help. <laughs> <laughs> so I screamed as loud as I can, help! But they're you know, more than a tenth of a mile away. They can't hear me with the wind and the rain and everything like that. I didn't expect them to, and it took me another minute to get the strength up to scream it again, help! No. So I was like, this is not, I, I did that a number of times and I finally gave up on that. But I'm looking up the bird and the bird was with me for about 15 out of those 22 minutes that I was in the water. The bird stayed with me the whole time. I'm looking at these guys in the boat and I'm still swimming towards them once in a while, yelling help. And they're not doing anything out there. I don't know, I don't know if they were angels or what after the whole experience, you know, like what are these people doing out in a storm like that? It's insane. Two boats. All of a sudden, I see one guy turn to the other and he's pointing in my direction. You know, and the guy goes, What? And they're looking in my direction. I'm thinking, Oh my God, they see me? They can't see me. It's black. The storm, the waves, the rain, everything, and the ground is, is black, but the sun is shining. I didn't figure it out till later. What they saw was the bird <sighs> lit up by the sun <sighs> against the black everything so they came towards where the bird was and right. then they saw me wow and rescued cool. me. that bird was that bird did send me a rope in, in, yes. in line and, and save my it was a miracle yeah I, I can't explain any other way because there's no way that i could have gotten help you know i kept on saying i'm gonna, I'm gonna do this I'm gonna stay focused in that moment mm -hmm. and be calm and enjoy the beauty of the sun, sunset we know I'm probably going to die. Yet there was that bird. And I, I didn't figure it out until later. But when I looked up at that bird, I saw it glowing in the dark sky. You know? I thought, gosh, it's like angels. They're glowing. But that's what it was. They saw that light bulb in the middle of the darkness. And it came to them. And they shouldn't have been out in that water in the first place. They brought me back to the island. And I spent the next five, six hours just sitting in front of a wood stove. You know, because I had thermal exposure. Oh, yeah. Just to get my warmth back. And I had a lot of thinking to do there. Peter, can I? Yeah, that's all I wanted okay. to say. Yeah, I was going to. So that keeping in that present and having a purpose, even though there's no way in hell that it, it, it's going to be. But my, my intention somehow created it. 
So that's that's the question I wanted to bottom line it. Um, like if you we were in men's group, I'd say, why don't we bottom line this now? So I'll reflect to you in the, the paraphrased version of what I, I heard is so the, the, the short answer is you use willpower to overcome fear. So at some point, it's either grace or willpower. And in your case, it sounds like both. We have the grace of the bird and the great chess player in the sky saying the sky isn't going down. And you had your personal willpower. That, that's the bottom line, like, right? Um, the story makes it was what makes it great, though. You know, it's a good story, you know, just bottom line. Oh, I use my willpower to overcome the fear. And then, you know, it's like, well, that's not a very good story. So it's better to have the story, I think, you know, just um, keeping like, do you want that's going to be that's recorded? You know, do you do you care? That's going to be on video. Fine. OK, I don't know how well the volume will be, but I go listen to it later. I'll let you know. Um, but it's, you know, it's vulnerable. It's a share. And so I just want to make sure it's going to be public. You know, it's on a public YouTube channel, you know, so I just want to make sure that, you know, anybody that speaks out or any name that's used, I want to make sure that you're okay with people potentially watching that. So, but willpower is a really important one. And there's the willpower, like, you know, like I've been out at Hazard Canyon where the waves are so big, like closing out. And this, this isn't an, even a closeout wave. And it's like, how am I going to get in? Well, but it was my confidence an, and my right. determination and my focus that created the miracle. So exactly. I created sure. the miracle because I wouldn't let go. Right. So, the, the, or I shouldn't say, maybe I didn't create the miracle, but doing that is potential for creating something that is You could say, like, there's like, there's like will and sort of lowercase, and then there's like will, will, you know, there's like will and there's will. Uh -huh. and, uh, you gotta, you know, you get the big will and some of that stuff. It's like, oh, it's, oh. Oh, oh no. Pizza. That's an old couch in there. I figured back there was safer, but okay. Um uh, never giving up hope. Constantly believing. Yeah, I don't I don't want to get too far from the top. So um I'll let those guys in. Thanks. I'll just put it back there for now. Deal for later. Thank you. That's because that's the that's the last part of the cycle of the five elements in the Chinese medical model and that that's one way that thought comes in and crystallizes in our body is um, through, so you start off with fear and willpower. I got this dream and I got to make it happen somehow. In this case, the dream is to stay alive um, or the dream can be, hey, I need to build this house or the dream can be, hey, I want to marry this person or hey, the dream can be, I need to make a garden, right? And so you need the willpower to sustain the next step, which is into the wood element, which is the anger part. So that's wood. And in the Chinese cycle, it's very poetic. Water feeds plants or new life, right? So they go from water to plasma energy. We call wood elements plasma energy of the embodiment of the dream into matter. So instead of getting angry about your situation, right, you get you just at peace watching this bird. And that's part of the staying alive part. The, the plasma, the, the thought form comes yeah, down. Like, really full of right. And then, and then water, then wood is fed by the sun, which is the next element in the cycle. Wood element becomes fire element. Well, fire of the sun causes plants to grow. We all know that, right? And then that's the manic and the joy, because usually when we're in the sun, we're more joyful than when we're in the dark, right? Dark is fear, light is joy, another duality. Then it goes on to, well, then the sun feeds all these plants, and then the next part of the cycle is the earth element, and that's usually harvest season. So now everything, the, and the, the, there's a circle is associated with the earth element. So your round squashes, right? Your cherries, your fruits, all the fruits of the previous three cycles of water, wood to fire, now producing the earth. And then the last part of the cycle, they call that the metal element of letting go. And in the tree, the tree lets, I'm watching it happen right now, the walnuts fall without trying. I love these human statements, I'll try. I don't see no fruits trying to fall to the ground. They just fall. <laughs> you know, the nature doesn't, the bird doesn't try and fly. It flies. So when I hear the word try in my world from a client, it means no. <laughs> try and maybe are equivalent to no. And then they know this in sales. You've got to get that yes. You're in sales until you get that yes. Oh, maybe it's a no. Anybody in sales knows that. And I'm selling help. And I'm selling spiritual, you know, stuff. So... Trying to maybe like, eh, no. You weren't trying to survive, you were surviving. There's a, there's a point of distinction there, right? I'm gonna try and make it. You weren't thinking about trying, I bet. Not even. I was doing it. You were just, just in doing. the moment, right? Yeah. And at Hazards Canyon, I wasn't trying to survive. 
I was set and determined, like somehow I'm going to make it in. And I did. And we all have stories like this. You know, we're not so unique. Everybody's got some stories where it's like, oh, supernatural power is taking over. And in a group like this, are you kidding me? We've all got three or four, you know? Um, do you see how poetic that is? Water feeds the, the new plants and then the sun makes them grow and then the earth element, you harvest them. And then they, the seed, the fruit drops and the seeds fall out and that's the metal element. And then, the, and then it goes back around to the water element because the water feeds the seed for the next cycle. Just a beautiful creation cycle they have in Chinese cosmology. So what I wanted to go back to, a couple more things is, um, see right here, those of you that are on the video recording, the, um, there's a photograph to, for these things I'm talking about. So you notice how the thoughts come in, and then I got this insight when I was doing this earlier that there's a part of our brain where we can have a forebrain, which we're choosing, or we can have a rear brain, which is reaction. This part of the brain is more conscious choosing. This part of the brain is more unconscious and instinct. Can we all agree on that? It's pretty well known. Yeah. So I even, I, from my spiritual teacher, I was taught, like, you're going to get this pullman of awakening and you're going to have an emergency signal go off in the rear brain because it's invested in staying in the animal. Just like the bugs are invested in us craving what they want from the last four weeks work, right? So that rear brain, so that's how I know where my crystallization of thought is. If I'm choosing, great. If I'm in reaction and instinct, eh, not good. The more chi and life force we have, you know, the more dangerous we are if we're unconscious. And we have lots of people without a life force, you know, kind of dangerous. And there's a little teeter-totter there. So that's our life, you know. None of us are solely awake. None of us are solely asleep. Just varying degrees of awakeness and asleepness. And hopefully we're awake enough that we're doing skillful choices and choosing and having willpower. And we're not living from the negative part of the creation cycle. So, you know, living from fear and then anger is the next one up and then mania and depression. And the negative part of the earth elements, anxiety, the positive parts, empathy and compassion, right? And then stuck in grief. And then the positive is willpower. Um, but what's the positive part of wood element? So there's a positive and negative emotion with every element. So the negative is anger, and then the the, the positive liver emotion would be. I gotta go back to that one. So just create the 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 follow through creativity to follow up and actually draw the vision or to write the song that keeps coming in, right? Yeah. So the the concentration, the persistence, that would be part of wood element. Thank you guys. Um, then the positive of um, fire is joy and discernment. The negative is judgment and bipolar. Remember, discernment's clean. I'm holding a white fox in my hand. Judgment is, I hate white foxes. <laughs> one's got a charge. The other one's sort of neutral. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, believe me. Uh, I got a lot of judgments, <laughs> self and other. Uh, then the positive earth element, we talked about that's empathy and compassion, natural connection. And the positive of grief is the ability to just take in and let go. Move on to the next one. That's how we know, like, that's what the Ten Commandments is. The Ten Commandments aren't commandments. That was a bunch of bullshit in translation. It's the Ten Road Signs on the Road of Life. They're, it's pointers. If you want to murder somebody, you're not in very good spiritual health. If you want to screw your neighbor's wife over and over again, you're probably not in very good health. If you want to steal from somebody, you're not in very good health. There are pointers of how you're doing on your spiritual life. And they turned them into commandments because they wanted to control people through the, the priesthood, right? Some people need, they need those rules because they're too asleep to know their own morals. And they know that. They've known that for millennia. But then some of us wake up. And more than ever now, I mean, it's like popcorn. These days. People waking up like popcorn. You know, and sound effects not included. Um, so I'm going to go back to this. Do you guys kind of grasp that, like, rear brain, front brain thing? Degree. I'm going to finish it off with, um, you know, I, it's funny because this was actually, I thought this was a, dry erase but it'll be in a permanent ink marker but each of those life forms i believe has a thought form associated with it 
parasites, funguses, viruses, mycoplasmas, bacteria, worms, flukes, and amoebas. I believe they all have a consciousness associated with each of them. And the more of them that live in us, the more they take over our thoughts and we think they're ours, but they're actually theirs. We're mostly bugs, remember, we're at least 10 to a thousand times more bugs than our own cells in our body. So we literally live in bug consciousness and we don't even know it. We're outnumbered at least 10 to one. And they're thinking too, you know, like I told you guys, I've studied dark field microscopy and people that study this stuff, they say that individual cells have individual personalities in our body that study the cells. So we're individual cells on the earth. The earth's a being. The natives knew that. We're the cocky, arrogant white man, you know, well, modern people, I guess we're not all white. Um, it's important to acknowledge that because um, I, I was a start, I was a Trekkie. I was at the Civic Auditorium, eight years old for a Star Trek convention when I was eight. Lifelong Trekkie. I've seen some Star Treks probably 15 times. And I just love Gene Roddenberry's vision. And he had, he was exploring this stuff of like, there are life forms out there and black holes have life of consciousness and moons have consciousness and these bugs have consciousness. And I, I was just blown away at his imagination of like, well, what he was putting out there was Star Trek. Wow. That's what, it's a cult thing. People, you know, the weirdos like me are like, oh, wow, look at all these archetypes. And then you've got the cracking joints. <laughs> Could it be your cracking joints or your thoughts becoming part of you? Could it be that trauma you had when you were a kid is still stored somewhere in your body? Could it be all that fungus ridden gut yeast you've got down there? is harboring and holding some emotional situation you can never process when you were younger? I'd say yes to all those questions. Because I've been through it. I've, I've been in my own unlayering for over 30 years. And many of us have. And bad thoughts. Now, I'm talking not in absolute terms here either. Generally, bad or unhelpful thoughts to me correlate with toxicity in my body or around too many other people, not enough of my own sovereign time to gas off that. Because the more people I hang around, the more I'm just sticky flight paper. I internalize other people's stuff all day, every day. I can't help it. So I have to spend time alone so it naturally processes out. So bad thoughts when I'm eating poorly, not getting enough sleep, and around too many social events, that's what happens to me. And then if I don't cut that off, my body gets sick. It gets physically sick. It happened, the last time it happened was with Paul Damon out at uh, the Gilroy Mountains. And we had a community out there. We were, we were starting our community. It would be great if we would have kept it. And we had about 15, 10, 15 people out there at all times, pretty much. And then guess what? Craig took on everybody's energy, tore my rotator cuff, didn't sleep for two weeks. And it was my right shoulder, masculine heart protector that tore out. And the metaphor wasn't lost on any of us. Like, Craig, you're taking on everybody's shit but I wasn't doing enough self-care. I wasn't doing enough of the alone time. And then for me, that's where God goes, Pow! you're out of balance. So we're gonna knock you back in shape. Yeah. But it also comes out like magic, right? Sound effects not included. <laughs> so the last one is nightmares. How many of us still have bad dreams? <laughs> nightmares? <laughs> not as much as when I was a kid. So that's it's from your work, right? Don't watch this so on the liver section of the standard process <laughs> system survey forms, Monica, as we've been talking about it, one of the questions is nightmares. And it's associated with liver toxicity. I used to have horrendous nightmares. And I, I turned my guts inside out and got my liver happier. And maybe 1% of my dreams are bad. Now. I would definitely agree that nightmares are part of a toxic body, mind, spirit complex. And toxicity is not fair to some people because they're just, they have trauma and abuse and they, eat, they might eat well, but then the psychic trauma hasn't finished yet, if you will. The awareness isn't through with the psychic trauma yet. If we depersonalize this stuff, I will tell you from years of meditating that awareness is fascinated with everything, including pain. That's why it doesn't go away because it's not done with it yet. And until we get behind that awareness, we're never going to go anywhere. I've been in a lot of pain. And every time I got behind what was actually fascinated with the pain, the pain went away very quickly. 
but it's very difficult to get behind that pain because it's not a human thing anymore. This is a transpersonal awareness that lives through us and is always and already present. That's what I'm kind of pointing us back to, is that practical thing. How do I get back to the always and already? The simplest one is your breath. The breath will always bring you back to the always and already. I'm here. That's how I know. That's how we come back here. That's how we disengage the mind. Because we can only do one thing at one at a time. So if you tell yourself, I'm going to focus on my breathing, then the mind stuff will go away. Or, but there's another piece to that. Because you can say, I'm going to focus on my breathing, but then you're still resisting the mind. When we leave the mind alone, it gets a lot calmer. Sincerely. You can't say, I'm leaving my mind alone and have it happen. You've got to sincerely sit with it for a while, like a child. I was with this kitten that was like eight weeks old this last three nights. You know, it's all over the place. There's no controlling it. But you leave it alone. And I, I do these experiments with little kids and little animals. So I give it 100% of my attention. It just really is purring. And, you know, and, and then it's like totally into me for like two minutes. And then I'm done with you. It moves on. Kids, same way. You give them 100% of your focus. They're done in two to five minutes. 100% though. Not the 75, not this 50% shit. 100%. You give a woman 100% focus in sex, she's happy as a clam. Most men are giving 100%. Are clams happy? <laughs> hey, that's a great question. Once we find them, probably not. Not in Pismo <laughs> Beach. Not in Pismo Beach, because they're all gone now. <laughs> happy as a clam. Yeah. Happy as a, uh, a better metaphor. Yeah, maybe clams aren't so happy. Yeah. Why, why did that come from? Well, maybe you just thought maybe it's the because the way the shape it looks like a smile, you know, and then when its mouth is open, right? Somebody had to have made that up at some point in the past. Oh, yes, it really caught on. (laughs) But are that's a great question though. Are they really happy? (laughs) Yeah. Not when you're shocking. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, right. It does. Um, okay, pretty good. We've got about an hour. Yeah, really <laughs> now, I brought a bunch of stuff in, and this, this conversation is going to continue, but I, I don't think this is, I think this is enough for tonight. So the nightmare is what we'll end on is, notice your thoughts. If you do an inventory, we have a self-inventory practice. Set your alarm every half hour and write down what you were thinking. And you get a couple hundred of those data points, and you start thinking, oh, wow, my thoughts aren't so positive after all. There's a random timer on the cell phone called Randomity. R-A-N-D-O-M-I-T-Y, Randomity app. And you just click it and then it sets off a random timer. And then you catch yourself. Timer goes off. What was I just thinking? Was I conscious? There's a whole, there's a whole workshop I have for this. And I did about 200 data points years ago and I thought I was Mr. Awake guy. Oh no, no. The random timer went off. It was like half the time I was asleep at the wheel and some kind of instinct or reaction. That I think. And my girlfriend had said so at the time. She was that same one. She's like, I pronounced it our third visit, how awake I was. Yeah. And I fell in love with her when she said, she just went, you're not, you're only about half awake. <laughs> I say, oh, I'm 90% awake. And she just shook her head. No, you're not. And I fell in love with her right there. Said, oh my God, my client's challenging me. Who is this lady? <laughs> <laughs> there was a scowl that really did. You're, you ain't so hot. <laughs> I love you. Please marry me. Keep my ego in check. <laughs> I think I find the best way to raise your um, positivity in your life is just daily gratitude journal. You don't have to be that long because when you catch yourself during the day, you can get bad thoughts or you can find them. It's to set, set you off the right way. And That's my work really all day, long. every day. Yeah. I have a series of four different mantras I go through and three different gratitudes. And Abraham says, if you can get out of that negative spiral for at least a minute, then you can usually at least remove yourself partially. So, but exactly, Lars. But then if we don't have the grace to remember to do that stuff, then we're still stuck. The post-it notes are great. Yeah, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, on the car mirror, by the bedroom. I, at one point I had sticky notes all over the house. Yeah. It's so helpful. Oh, it's so helpful. It's so helpful. It's amazing. That's why that poster's there. That poster's there as a reminder. I'm going forward. There's no going back. The bridge is burning behind me. All I've got is forward. So I used to go back. I used to go back. You can't, there's no going back now. The world we once knew, you know. 
Right. It, it's being destroyed. So we've got to build the new world together. Uh, so I think it's important just to, to note, like, do you remember your dreams, first of all? And so if you're a regular weed user like me, I'm probably not going to remember them as much. But the important dreams to me always come through no matter what state I'm in. I've been drunk and had them come through. It's like, oh, I was meant to remember that one. So uh, what is dreaming? What is dreaming? By a lot of accounts, the unconscious doing its very best to give us messages mm. in code and in uh, symbols that are very meaningful to us individually as well as archetypally. So what if I shorten that and said, dreams are the subconscious digesting our experience. Yeah. It's subconscious, emotional, and psychic digestion. Not making sense of it. Sometimes but... giving. Not always just digesting. Sometimes giving. Well, that's your experience. Yeah. yeah. I don't feel like I'm being given to. I feel like I'm, in, in the, the best case scenario, I, I am the dream itself and the observer of it and the characters within it. It's this omniscience that comes for me and it's really good. It's like, I'm teaching myself. I'll have a voice talking and there's another part listening and I'm like, which one am I? So just I like to shorten stuff so that people remember you. It's like, it's the digestion of our emotional experience and that's easily remembered. And mantra, same way, a short mantra, easy to remember, a long mantra, hard to remember. In men's work, we have statements. Let's bottom line that, let's get it down to a quick sentence or a statement, easy to remember. Right. In health, same thing. One of my teachers, KIS, was his acronym. Keep it simple. And let's do it right. KIS, Stuart? No. No, KIS, keep it simple. No extra S. No extra S. No extra S. So, yeah, there's. Um, there's the dream world and i'll finish with um so what is dreaming well um carlos castaneda has a book called the art of dreaming and they were trying the work they were doing was they were trying to manifest their dreaming bodies in the physical world and there are teachers that have done that yogananda's guru and autobiography yogi was in two places at once at one point in the book he was having dinner with some people on one side of india and a thousand miles away he was on a train with another set of people this is documented. So, Could he have been eating in both places? My question is, is the dreaming body actually eating? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Is the dreaming body actually eating is the well, question. It's digesting. Right? It's doing something, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's doing something. So what was Sri Yukatsuar doing? You know, where was the real him, you know? I mean, Castaneda got confounded by Don Juan Manas and Don Gennaro, the two main characters that were teaching him. And Don Gennaro would just appear out of thin air and he would, he would literally like swim on the earth. He would get down on the earth, like on his belly and he would like swim. And th there was no rational explanation of how he could be moving along the ground, like moonwalking. He's a swimming motion, but he's, he's cruising along the ground, like swimming on the earth. Wow. How, how, what, how long is he doing that? You know, there's a story in Chronicles of Tao written by a, a Taoist master that came over to the States in the early thirties. And he met the two famous wandering Taoists. They were real famous. and he said that it's true, they didn't have footprints when they walked. Mm -hmm. They walked along the earth and left no trace at all. Now, you know, we don't know, we weren't there. But I wanted to end with, with that is, you know, we, we're, we don't really know what dreaming is. We don't really know what the gut is. We don't really know what microbes are. We make these assumptions. And then that's why Jesus said it's easier for a, uh, a rich man to get in heaven than putting an eye of the needle. What was that an eye of the needle Camel part? Through the eye the Camel through the eye. He's not talking about wealth. He's talking about arrogance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're rich in concept, when you're rich in your arrogance, you're not going to get anywhere into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. I think he said it the wrong way. It's not easier. It's harder. Harder for a rich man to get in heaven than yeah. it is to get the camel through the eye of the needle. Right. 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 Thank you. The rich man just like gave you that idea and wanted you to put it out on, on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. You're controlled, man. Yeah. <laughs> Darn rich man. And that's why, you know, Chief Seattle and the white man came and says, I have nothing to teach you because you already know everything. That's what he means, rich in concept. I have nothing to teach you. You're already so full of concept, I can't teach you anything. You're full of your own bullshit. There's a white man right there. 
Remember my Japanese teacher? I've used this quote a hundred times, the old Japanese master 20 years ago. I got one word to say about Western medicine. And we're all like, you know, the master's talking, so, you know. Arrogance was his one word for Western medicine. We don't know what's going on in the gut. Anybody tells you they do, run, run. We don't know as much as we say we do. And anybody that says they do, I tell you, run. It's a cocky, arrogant person. You don't want them playing with your life. You want someone with humility playing with your life, don't you? Mm -hmm. I don't want some cocky MD with Rockefeller medicine credential and that him with my life mm -hmm. that thinks he knows everything when he knows nothing. Mm -hmm. Those are the worst people that the ones who think they're awake and they're asleep. Those are the most dangerous people walking. Mm -hmm. It's better to be, gee, I don't know anything and I don't want to know anything, but there's a tiny part of me that does want to know something. That's a better state than I, you know, I know and I don't want to, you know, don't really care. Greg Paul, that was Greg Paul's work in the sovereign way. Was that was that was one the lowest was I know everything and I don't want to know anything else. The next level up is well, I don't know anything and I don't want to know anything, but there's a part of me that does want to know. That's kind of convoluted, but you know, it's better than I don't want to know and I know everything. And the top state is, guess what the top state is? I know nothing. <laughs> I mean, when a client comes in to see me, that's where I start. Big question mark. Empty canvas. I have another couple of naturopath stories. Just the one that you know, actually, just horrendous, you know, so cocky, so arrogant, overcharging, no results. Thousand dollars later, no results. Because they're coming in with their concepts and their canvas isn't empty. I'm going to apply my square peg on your round hole. You're going to go into a raw food nutritionist. Well, they got the, they got the one trick pony, raw foodism. You don't want a one trick pony, do you? You want a multiple trick pony. I don't want to go to the raw foodist as much as I don't want to go to the paleo guy. I want a guy, somebody that's going to look at me and go, wow, I see you for who you are, which is a mystery. And I'm willing to sit in that mystery with you <coughs> and love you and not abandon you when times get tough. That was the schizophrenic thing that what they found out was that the schizophrenics who got better were the ones where the therapist would refuse to give up. And the schizophrenic just felt that devotion. And that got them through to the other side, back to reality. I'm sure, there's a lot more than schizophrenia. I think that any client that comes to see me, I tell them if they need to hear it, I tell them I won't give up on you. I'm a bulldog. I will sit by your side. You know, I've sat by people when they died. You know? Taurus. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. I think I'm gonna turn. Uh, anything else you guys want on the recording? Finish with. I like that you started with the anger is. Um, the lack of creativity, and you also quoted recently with us that fatigue is a lack uh, of creativity. Or, uh, uh, what was the what was that quote? That was so interesting. No, it was the one of the problems with um, healthcare these days was a lack of imagination. Oh, the fatigue. You said when people have fatigue, the their creativity is lacking. I probably channel. I probably channeled that, and not to go back to what I said. Um, so you could have fatigue for a lot of reasons, and um, well, we're still recording. So this is a great one to have on the recording, actually. So years ago, um, when I was started doing yoga, I get fatigued really easy. I didn't have a lot of stamina, and my my breath too. Like my friends could swim, you know, in the Olympic. Sorry, it was curiosity. Lack of curiosity and fatigue. Yeah. Well. Yeah, it, it ends up, shit, I lost me. It boils down to, um, you, you get this, <clears throat> there's a lot, so I gotta go back like one more step. There's a lot of reasons why we might have fatigue. And so one of the reasons why you have fatigue is uh, stagnation. Stagnation. And how do you know if you have fatigue from stagnation? Well, I found that out 25 years ago. Is you get, I used to say to myself, if I can just get, because I started out doing yoga, doing five postures for 30 days. Richard Hittleman's 30 Days to Yoga was the name of the book. And, um, and as a 21-year-old, it just broke my neck. I was like, he says, I can do five minutes of yoga for 30 days and I'll never stop. Wow, I can do five minutes a day. It's a forward bend, an extension, a backward bend, a twist, a side bend, and a rolling motion. And that was it. And I figured, well, I can do that. You know, so I can get curious about that. Um, and then I'm really struggling keeping this on the same tangent. Um,
Oh, so then um, thanks. <laughs> Spirit just told me. So you come back and you get, I would get five minutes into a workout. I do those five basic postures, forward bend, backward bend. And then if I notice if I'm five minutes into a workout and I start to have energy, then I know that it's fatigue from stagnation. If I get five or 10 minutes into a workout and I'm still exhausted, then I'm exhausted. It's a good checkpoint. I, that always worked for me was just go try for five minutes. It's not overwhelming to think about when you're tired. It's not, you know, I can do a few, you know, I can swing my arms and do this and, you know, jump up and down a few times and, oh yeah, I'm starting to feel better. Maybe I should do more. Or you do the Raglan's test, which uh, mine's been dropping 15 points for the last three weeks consistently. So I'm just not getting enough rest. Uh, you know, there's always the next drama. So it's like, this boils down to not resting enough. So then there's, um, there's fatigue from overeating. There's fatigue from too much anger. There's fatigue from the blood sugar going up and down all day where you've exhausted your adrenals. And there's fatigue from boredom. And that's kind of what I think we were poking at. If you have fatigue from boredom, then yeah, it's a lack of imagination. I was actually at a keg party, you know, the, back in the day, 30, 35 years ago. And I was, I used to, I would usually sit in the corner because I was mostly straight. I'd sit in the corner and observe people making idiots of themselves, you know, when they're drunk. It was so entertaining. And so this girl comes over to me and, and um, I, I, I guess I looked at bored. She goes, you look bored. And I'm like, and I, and I was like, no, like 22, 23. I was like, I thought about it. I was like, oh, am I bored? And I told her, I go, you know, I haven't been bored in about five or six years. Because there's so many interesting things. Like, I'll, I mean, I'll sit in my room and meditate and laugh at my own thoughts. Like, oh, oh, there's that homicidal thought again. There's that suicidal thought again. Oh, oh, what a rerun. You know, there's that fantasy of a woman, you know, whatever. It's, it's a, I mean, it's a shit show of beauty and pain going on in me all day. So I, I was like, no, I, I'm not bored. But I realized that she was bored and she was putting her projection on me because she was lacking imagination. I was having a good old time looking at Joe Bob trying to hit on Sammy Joe over there. And, you know, <laughs> so entertaining. The groping, you know, I, I grew up with a surf crowd. So they're you know, they always trying to find ways to, to weasel a grope in, you know, like, you know, in a crowd, like, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to grab your ass. You know, it's the kind of guys I know. It's horrible. <laughs> what can you get away with? See, there's that five-year-old thing, right? These guys are, 15. no, five-year-old in a 40-year-old body, oh. not 15. I'm barely 15 after 30 years of work. You know, so most guys are five to 10 in an adult body. And these rich people I've been looking at, you know, oh my God. Entitlement doesn't make you grow any faster, that's for sure. Does that help? That kind of helpful? Okay. It was a nice way to end it. Oh, yeah. There's nothing better than that exploration of like, you know, a lack of imagination and stuckness and stagnation. How do we find ourselves out? And the first step is the grace kind of drops in, right? The grace drops in and goes, oh, oh. oh yeah, I was in this little spiral and I call it a thought eddy. I was in a thought eddy and I just need to get the creek flowing. Like the acupuncturist, they hit a point and you go, ow! That's an eddy of energy. It should be moving and it's just eddying there and you hit the point, it usually releases it and if it doesn't come back and you hit it. So I recheck points and it's like, does that still hurt? And, no, it doesn't. It's so rewarding. I mean, you got a few ladies right now and you know, chest is opening up. I got this guy, he had parasites in his brain and his skull plates are cracking and he says when he gets work done now, his chest cracks open and ah, it means they're, you know, stuff's coming out and coming into the light of consciousness i get really excited okay we'll call this one over and get to our little side pitch i'm sure it'll be some personal stuff uh july 20th so there might be a community dinner recording that i'll post but it won't be a live recording so there won't be any community dinner for two weeks next one will be 23rd 30th august 6th i guess yeah friday after probably something around august 6th goodbye folks